Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight to hear some poems from Tess Taylor's poetry anthology, Leaning Toward Light, Poems for Gardens and the Hands that Tend Them. My name is Sophia Bannister. I work closely with our program director, Jennifer Franklin. We're thrilled to have you here on Zoom tonight to celebrate this beautiful collaboration between some of the most imaginative contemporary poets of our time, celebrating the life-giving diversity of gardens. I want to thank our founder, the award-winning poet, Margot Taft Stever, whose vision and hard work are responsible for the Hudson Valley Writers' Center embarking on its 35th year. I want to thank, to thank the board, the members, our students and teachers who are the beating heart of the center and our generous funders, NISCA and Arts Westchester, as well as the foundations who support us, including Bydale, David G. Taft, Lucille and Paul Maslin, Gannett, St. Faith's House, Allen B. Silk Foundation, New York Community Trust, and Zand Charitable Trust. Thank you to my colleagues, our wonderful program director, Jennifer Franklin, Christina Papadopoulos, and here tonight with me, Misty Yarnall, for all their hard work and vision of bringing poetry and prose to an ever-growing audience, both in person in Sleepy Hollow in New York and by Zoom. If this is your first time joining us for a reading, welcome. If you haven't already gotten your copy of Leaning Toward Light, you can use the code HVWC at checkout for 20% off through February 2nd at the Hatchet Book Group website. Misty will add this information and the link to purchase the anthology to the chat. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Tess Taylor. Tess Taylor lives in El Cerrito, California, where she raises artichokes on the sidewalk median strip, has four chickens in the backyard, and is working to restore a community orchard. Her body of work as a writer deals with place, ecology, and cultural reckoning. She published five celebrated poetry collections, The Misremembered World, The Forage House, Last West, Road Songs for Dorothea Lange, Work and Days, and Rift Zone, and served as the on-air poetry reviewer for NPR's All Things Considered for over a decade. Her work as a cultural critic appears in Harper's Magazine, The Atlantic, The Kenyan, the Kenyan Review, Poetry, Tin House, The Times Literary Supplement, CNN, and The New York Times. Her latest work, Leaning Toward Light, Poems for Gardens and the Hands that Tend Them, is a collection of contemporary gardening poems for an era of climate crisis, which includes poems by some of the most luminary poets writing today. Please join me in welcoming Tess Taylor. Hi, thank you so much for having me and joining uh, Hudson Valley Writers Workshop and for that lovely introduction. And to everyone on Zoom, um, thank you for joining us on a winter evening or a winter afternoon, wherever you are, um, to settle in and hear some words about seasons and growth and seeds and light. Um, this, it's it's always good to read on Zoom because in some ways, um, Zoom reminds me of the pandemic and the pandemic was when this book began. It began in a moment when a friend of mine who knew me from a time I worked on the farm in the Berkshires invited me um, for a phone call and she'd become an editor and she said, Tess, I really think that there needs to be a new kind of anthology about gardening. I want it to be a, feel contemporary. I want it to speak to why we garden now. Um, and the timing couldn't have been better because I was out in the front yard and I literally had dirt under my fingernails. I was gardening in the front yard um, partly because that's where I can garden. That's where the Western sunlight is, but also because people would come by and there was this sort of impromptu hub, people standing at a distance, sharing gardening stories, gardening advice and plants. Um, my next door neighbor talked about shiitake mushrooms on the side of her house and a guy around the corner brought by his um, Ukrainian tomato starts that survived the fog. And it was like our plants could be friends when we couldn't. And it was a way in which I thought about the fact that gardens build community from the soil up. They make the soil richer. They make the ecosystem more diverse. They invite in pollinators. Um, at my community garden in Brooklyn, there were once um, an entomologist who found out that in the wider New York area, <laughs> 
there were about three species of pollinators per block. But at our community garden, which was just the site of two brownstones that were no longer there, there were 47 species of pollinator. And so these spaces that we build actually build diversity and repair. And I wanted to make a book that embodied the way that art does that as well, the way that poems can do that as well. So I had the delight of reaching out to some of the most luminary poets working today, um, many of whom are actually gardeners. And I was able to assemble this book that is um, both diverse and earthy and full of poems by people writing right now about what it means to try to take care of the earth in this moment of precarity and the kind of community that we build with the, each other and the non-human world when we try to do this. So it doesn't make sense in a reading this big full of this many incredible people, as incredible as they are, for me to read their bios fully one by one. So I can't do that. It would take so long. What I want to do is just know, have you know that these incredibly distinguished poets have their bios in the chat. We have the Poet Laureate of Alabama. We have NEA winners. We have National Book Award winners. Um, and I'm waiting for that bio, those lat list of bios to appear in the chat, by the way. So, <laughs> and, um, and, and they are going to read in alphabetical order of their first name, um, to their own poems from the book, as well as some others. So you'll have this kind of um, bouquet. Uh, one of the joys of this making this anthology was learning that um, anthology actually means bouquet. So here in the chat, you can see that we have these incredible poets, Ashley Jones, Bryn Sato, Danusha Lamaris, um, Ellen Bass. And I really encourage you to drink deeply and savor their words. Each of them has been such a gift to work with. Each of them is such a gift actually to the community of art and the community of poetry. Each of them is a pollinator um, of many new poems um, and many new artists actually. Um, so welcome, uh, sit back, let yourself take the ride with poetry this afternoon. We'll read for a little over an hour. We'll have some chance to chat. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to each of you or hearing from you as well. Um, I'll begin with a poem at the beginning of the book, which the book, by the way, is, is very pretty. Um, what the Washington Post called it lush and all kinds of other kind things, but it also said the book is extraordinarily pretty. <laughs> um, and I, I just, I think that grownups don't get enough illustrated books. I think we need them also. But here's the first poem in the book as well. By Ross Gay. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which most likely some of them continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. Thank you. Ashley, will you take it from here? I will take it away. Um, this is so exciting. So uh, I'm Ashley and I'll be reading three poems. These three poems are about humanity and the way we could all grow together if only we understood that we come from the same root. The first is my own poem called Photosynthesis for my late father. When I was young, my father taught us how dirt made way for food, how to turn over soil so it would hold a seed, an infant bud, how the dark could nurse it until it broke its green arms out to touch the sun. In every backyard we've ever had, he made a little garden plot with room for heirloom tomatoes, corn, carrots, peppers, jalapeno, bell, and poblano, okra, eggplant, lemons, collards, broccoli, pole beans, watermelon, squash, 
trees filled with fruit and nuts, Brussels sprouts, herbs, basil, mint, parsley, rosemary, onions, sweet potatoes, cucumber, cantaloupe, cabbage, oranges, Swiss chard, and peaches, sunflowers tall and straight-backed as soldiers, lantana, amaryllis, echinacea, pansies, and roses, and bushes bubbling with hydrangeas. Every plant with its purpose, flowers to bring worms and wasps, even their work matters here. This is the work we have always known, pulling food and flowers from a pile of earth. The difference now, my father is not a slave, not a sharecropper. This land is his and so is this garden, so is this work. The difference is that he owns this labor. The work of his own hands for his own belly, for his own children's bellies. We eat because he works. This is the legacy of his grandmother, my great granny, Ollie Mae Harris and her untouchable flower garden. Just like her hats, her flower beds sprouted something special. Plants and colors the neighbors could only dream of. He was young when he learned that this beauty is built on work the cows and the factories in their stomachs, the fertilizer they spewed out, the stink that brought such fragrance. What you call waste, I call power. What you call work, I make beautiful again. In his garden, even problems become energy, beauty, my father has ended many work days in the backyard, worries of the firehouse dropping like grain. My father wrist deep in soil. I am convinced the earth speaks back to him as he feeds it. It is a conversational labor, gardening. The seeds tell him what they will be. The soil tells seeds how to grow. My father speaks sun and water into the earth. We hear him each harvest, his heartbeat sweet like fruit. This poem is by Naomi Shihab Nye, Palestine Vine. Seeds wrapped tenderly in plastic one package said white, one red. Hand lettered, mailed by friends I never met. They grew instantly, strangely confining themselves to one corner of the metal container, as if a metaphor. I swear I planted them all over. Leafy vines popped forth, glory and green lengthening overnight. I didn't notice one had twined around the rungs of the table. Today, moving the pot, the biggest vine ripped out, broke off. No, how could I have missed the simple wrapping of the tendril, suggesting happiness in that exact light? Its roots remain, a broken stem. I wasn't evil but I wasn't careful. This is what happens in the world. Now, soaking snipped vine in a glass of water, feeling the hope and weight of so many years. And the final poem that I will read is by my patron saint of poetry, Lucille Clifton, Cutting Greens. Curling them around, I hold their bodies in obscene embrace, thinking of everything but kinship. Collards and kale 
strain against each strange other, away from my kiss-making hand and the iron bed pot. The pot is black. The cutting board is black. My hand and just for a minute, the greens roll black under the knife and the kitchen twists dark on its spine. And I taste in my natural appetite, the bond of live things everywhere. Thank you. Rin. That was beautiful, Ashley. Thank you. Um, I love gardens. I'm not great at gardening, but I'm I'm the daughter of a Japanese American gardener and who's part of a long line of Japanese gardeners and Japanese American gardeners. And um, Tess and I have talked a lot about uh, the camps, the incarceration camps. My grandparents uh, met in the camps in Arizona and so many of the camps um, had gardens at the camp in Gila River, Arizona. They found 300 ponds and gardens and ways that the community uh, made beauty, you know, in the desert when they were imprisoned. And, and it also was about survival. It helped them um, stave off the valley fever. And so I love gardens as a space of survival and, and beauty and beauty as survival. And I think this book really captures that so wonderfully. So it's an honor to be here. I'm going to read three poems. Um, this first poem is the poem, um, my poem in the anthology. It's called Dear Damselfly. And it was actually written when I was in Ireland. Dear damselfly, all summer long the red fur rhubarb crosses over. Spirits fight up through the scallions, wasps shadow the crocuses with their family talk. I travel from June to June seeking a beauty like yours, kiss-shaped, unstandardized, coptering the long grass like a news flight over Manhattan. What have I loved? The tended soil and the thrashing that breaks it. Gray-skinned stems dying and alive cycle up the lattice. Bees drone the sound wound, the sun sunny hum of community. You with your smoke eyes are all seeing, predacious and singular over lake waters. Deroot me from this garden. And I'm gonna read a poem next by my friend, dear friend, the poet Alan Cesaro. And uh, this is Alan's fabulous poem, Photosynthesis, Chanaka Hodge hosts a block party. Everything begins by absorbing hydrogen from dirt as DJs spin 90s R&B with weed smoke and wet skin becomes the oxygen of our body dance and it begins with inhalation, roots, rhubarb, sunflowers, the hot stench of chicken mess, a thick aerosol of summer paints, fat Adidas laces and barbershop fades, the mixing of light and dark and dark with liquor. I'll say the names of these neighborhood trees out loud, Southern Magnolia, Maidenhair, Chinese Flame, Kentucky Coffee, and I'll ask what our cosmology is, if not this, and when I say cosmology, no, I mean blessings. And when I say blessing, I mean this Sunday afternoon, because darkness is a prayer that must come over us. It is the promise of empty parking lots filled with movements that can be traced back to footstepped rhythms and chain link fences, the neon blaze of a nose ring on a woman's brown nose, and it begins by observing the astronomy of our limbs while remembering to sip whatever slow honey is poured from your lips like the garden in my throat as your voice becomes this shovel, becomes my hands digging your waste. And lastly, I'm gonna close with another friend of ours, Jason Myers, love this poem. It's called Closing In. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you to Tess. Um, Hudson Valley, just, uh, this is just so wonderful to be here. Thank you. Closing in, more and more needles fall from the pines. Everywhere symbols, if that's your thing. To live always in the possible, to urge your flesh to be as keen as melons softening on summered vines. I am tired of everything that isn't lovely. 
I am tired of the way my shoulders hoard stress, stacks and stupid stacks. Everybody's an expert in somebody else's business. I do not want to be any busier than my basil plant, swallowing the sun, the soil, the errant water. We suppose we know a thing or two about botany, about the intelligence of leaf, stem, root. Have you noticed the way plants lean, as though longing for news from a neighbor, a song, a touch, just a little touch? It has been a hard season for bodies, for the given strangeness of care. Even now, the kind of the kind music of a lark lingering in the crepe myrtle has something bereft about it, like a whistle moving through lips, sounds going and coming, the desirer closing in on the desired. Thank you. Tanisha. Hello, hello, everybody. And that was so beautiful, all the, the reading. I'm so grateful to get to listen to other people read. When I forget to be grateful for my life, I think, but there's gatherings like this. And I get to hear poetry. And it's such such a gift. I, I enjoy being on the passive end of it at least as much, I mean, probably more so <laughs> doing the reading. But thank you all. And thank you, Tess, for the good and hard work of putting all these poems together and offering us this bouquet that is really completed by all the listeners and readers who are part of that bouquet as well. So honoring all of you. And I'll just dive in and read, even though I'm interrupting my puppy who thinks this is her nap time here on the desk. I'm just going to interrupt her. I'll start with Cheslav Milos's poem, which if you have the book is on page 74, and it's called Gift. A day so happy. Fog lifted early. I worked in the garden. Hummingbirds were stopping over honeysuckle flowers. There was no thing on earth I wanted to possess. I knew no one worth my envying him. Whatever evil I had suffered, I forgot. To think that once I was the same man did not embarrass me. In my body, I felt no pain. When straightening up, I saw the blue sea and sails. Love that little poem. Yay, poetry. Um, this next poem comes with a cautionary statement <laughs> that I'd like to make. It's called Feeding the Worms, and it's really be careful what you make fun of and who. Because I really used to make fun of people that constantly talked about their garden worms. And I specifically went to an Earth Day festival where there was a whole gathering of people very excitedly talking about their worms. And I turned to my husband and said, don't let that ever happen to me. And then they gave me a yogurt carton filled with red regular worms. And I've never been the same. I'm obsessed with my worms. I love feeding them. I love to talk about them and think about what they do for the garden. And I'm a worm freak, which is not the outcome I was hoping for. So it could, could happen to you. Beating the worms. Ever since I found out that earthworms have taste buds all over the delicate pink strings of their bodies, I pause dropping apple peels into the compost bin. Imagine the dark writhing ecstasy, the sweetness of apples permeating their pores. I offer beets and parsley, avocado and melon, the feathery tops of carrots. I'd always thought there's a menial life, eyeless and hidden, almost vulgar. Though now it seems they bear a pleasure so sublime, so decadent. I want to contribute 
however I can. Forgetting a moment, my place on the menu. Love those worms, but they're going to love me more at some point. <laughs> it's all very humbling. And um, and next, a poem that, you know, honors that a garden is often a place of grief and a place to visit our losses. And this has certainly been true for me. And I appreciate Tess for talking about that as well in this anthology, that there's the abundance and the garden is also a place where we are always engaging with our losses. Working in the garden, I think of my son, who is nothing now but a few fistfuls of ash. Not even that, since ash dissolves and is taken into the bodies of plants or swept into the air on the wind. He's so very fine. He slips undetected through a whale's baleen or a beetle's gullet. He can even rise through a stalk of grass with the upward pull of phloem in these first green days of spring. He has no use now for the soft black hair through which I would run a slender comb, nor for his oddly shaped thumbs, nor anything in this world. Though the things of the world may have use of him, his molecules filtering through them, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, a whisper of hydrogen, the modest building blocks of life, quietly and without announcement. Thank you all. So grateful for you, David. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, David Baker, and I'm really pleased to be with you and grateful to Tess for putting this gorgeous book together and getting us all together. You realize, people, it's Friday night, and here we are. There must be something important about a poem and about a garden and about keeping each other company in places like this. That's why I'm here to hear you and to sit with you and to share a couple of poems I'm grateful to the Story Press people, grateful to the Hudson Valley people as well. I'm going to read three poems, um, beginning with a little one of mine in the book. Um, I live in a little village in Ohio, and I've gardened and kind of farmed and gardened all my life. My partner lives in the East Village, um, so I go to that other kind of city um, often. And I've discovered a kind of garden in New York City that I that I love. This is a poem called Pocket Garden in the City. You would miss it if you were hurrying, if you were harried, or the day was drab. It's tucked between two old brown stones, now a defunct pet store, a pop-up for sneakers. Take the stone path back. It's so narrow. The leaning greenery like sticky sleeves. Sunflower above like a lighthouse. The ocean aroma of yellow hibiscus. But what are they doing? Two cops in the back corner, under a lime tree, hooded figure between them. What's your name? You stand there. And they stand there. Snapdragon. Hollyhock. Day lilies ablaze. I'm going to read two more poems by, by friends of mine. Um, this is a poem on page 98, if you're in your hymnal, if you're following along, a poem by 
Brenda Hillman. I chose these two poems because of the, I think, the personality, the voice, the absolute attitude in these poems. The practice of talking to plants. Mama and I, we talk to plants, for we are short girls close to the ground, and speech is the golden miracle. I learn to write while she says, honey, making a fire pouch in the Y to a speckled banana whose existence is energy broth. To limp chrysanthemum, she says, come on, and drops a bare aspirin in. I curve our letters near a holla after it lent some needles to my leg. We're not good relaxers, childhood. And I, we suffer a leafy need while God is a missing hypotenuse. We'll not a dreaded dandelion meet before her voice arrives at low violets in summer when spicy seeds escape so fine a pepper tree to make sachet for the lingerie drawer. We speak to spices they put on Jesus, those poor bright spices staring in the dark. He hath numbered every hair on your head, she said, meaning she hath numbered the hairs. When we are out with our strangeness in the West, she in her desert, I on the mountain crouching near Lilium Parvum with the same amount of frail our mother feels it will be quiet for a while, but syllables are there inside a leaf, a syllable, inside a syllable, a door. And one more. This is by Chai Elliott. This is on page 92. I think I've known Chai for 25 years or so. Um, I thought for a minute I'd go out and get a rope and bring this one in, um, but I, I thought better of it. You'll see why with this poem. All else is pale echo, dear. What's in my locker? What's in my pocket? What grows green from my left eye socket? Lock of hair. Lint and house key, holly, my love's a building, a garden folly. My love's a bird, my love's a plea. My love, meet me in the orangery with your fat watch ticking in a garden glove and vermiculite spilling on the floor like proof, like feed in a barn, high squared over six. My love, lend me 12 willow sticks unswear to put me on the shelf. Midas, touch me, forget yourself. Thanks everybody. Amazing, thank you. Um, next we have Ellen Bass, the marvelous Ellen Bass. Thanks everybody for your beautiful, wonderful, joyful and moving poems. Um, thanks Tess and um, thanks Hudson Valley folks for making this happen. And, you know, my, my, um, my job, uh, self-appointed is always to sell the book. Um, and so if you haven't bought it yet, you can even, you know, go online and you can get it from um, many places. It doesn't have to be Amazon. As you know, there's many other places to get it from. And buy extra copies is really good. Uh, they're great presents. And even though, uh, it, you know, what, where are we now? We're in January. It's not that far, you know, for Mother's Day and Father's Day. We're going to like blink four times and it will be there. You can buy it now and just have it already. I, I have to admit, I am not a gardener, nor am I a cook, but um, my wife and son are both, and I am in high demand as a sous chef, 
because, um, well, you'll hear. Um, this poem is called Sous Chef. I like cutting the cucumber, the knife slicing the darkness into almost transparent moons, each with its own thin rim of night. I like smashing the garlic with the flat of steel and peeling the sticky, papery skin from the clove. Tell me what to do, I'm free of will. I carve the lamb into one-inch cubes. I don't use a ruler, but I'd be happy to. Give me a tomato, bright as a parrot. Give me peaches like burning clouds. I'll pair those globes until dawn. The syrup will linger on my fingers like your scent. Let me escape my own insistence. I am the bee feeding the queen. Show me how you want the tart glazed. I still have opinions, but I don't believe in them. Let me fillet the supple bones from the fish. Let me pit the cherries, husk the corn. You say how much cinnamon to spice the stew. I've made bad decisions, so I'm grateful for this yoke lowered onto my shoulders potatoes mounted before me. With all that's destroyed, look how the world still yields a golden pear, freckled and floral, a shimmering marble. It rests in my palm so heavily, perfectly. Somewhere there is hunger, somewhere fear, but here the chopping block is solid, my blade sharp. And, um, I owe this poem to my wife, too. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my office. Um, my office right now is flooded, so I'm not in there. Um, but uh, most of the time I'm in there, and my wife is in the garden a lot. And she came in one day, and she said, here, write about this, and handed me this peach. Um, I guess if I wasn't going to come out, she would try and bring as much garden in as possible. So this is an ode to the first peach. Only one insect has feasted here. A clear stub of resin plugs the scar, and the hollow where the stem was severed shines with juice. The fur still silvered like a call. Even in the next minute, the hairs will darken, turn more golden in my palm, heavier this flesh than you would imagine, like the sudden weight of a newborn. Oh, what a marriage of citron and blush. It could be a planet reflected through a hall of mirrors, or what a swan becomes when a fairy shoots it from the sky at dawn. At the beginning of the world, when the first dense pith was ravished, and the stars were not yet lustrous coins fallen from the pockets of night. Who could have dreamed this world would be curried from the chaos? Scent of morning and sugar, bruise and hunger, silent, swollen, clefted life, remnant always remaking itself out of that first flaming ripeness. And I'm going to end with this wonderful little poem by Ann Fisher Worth, Exeodus, after Christopher Smart. For the tomato is an orb of holy light, for its seeds are the defenders of heaven. For if the vine grow freely, it will scale the vault of the stars. Thank you. That word means thisness, hysitas. It's an amazing word. So, such a good poem. Um, now we get to hear from Hala. Hala.
Sorry, I thought you unmuted me. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, just saying that it's a really pleasure, a real pleasure to hear everyone read. I'm very grateful for everything, for everyone who has brought this together, for Tess, for all the effort and love and passion and, and you know, time you put into uh, creating this book and um, bringing us together tonight. And I also will read from Ann Fisherworth. And I was saying too, it's such a delight to hear people read because it just really brings the, the poem off the page into three dimensional, five dimensional maybe, um, experience. So here's Ann Fisherworth as well. Um, this is called Mississippi Invocation. Come green, fill our veins with tendrils and broad lobed leaves wave as the rain approaches teach us the secret of swoon exhaustion come great petaled magnolias scrotal figs in the crooks of branches scarlet bells of carolina creeper bruised gardens mosses and lichens that fur the bark of oaks come fungi come buzzards this teeming is death is teeming, the walls of our houses, the doors of our senses dampen and soften, plunge us into see, sleep and deliquescence. We are sap and vine and solstice, ooze us, rot us, make us hot and hotter, jasmine, wisteria, twine us, ensnare us, stupefy us with your sugary blossoms. So that's a delight. I love that poem. Okay, now we're going to go to um, this poem by Tom Gunn. I like to say Gunn because it's two ends. Wonderful poet. <laughs> Fennel. High fog, white sky above me on the bouldered hill where I stumble between head high and scattered clumps of weed. Fennel, of which I once thought seed made you invisible. Each forms a light green mist, feathery auras, though the look deceives, for looked at closely, they consist of tiny leading into tinier leaves in which each fork is sharply separate yet tender, touched. I pinch a sprig and sniff, and it reminds me of the other times I have pinched fennel sprigs for this fierce poignancy. Poignancy. Po <laughs> I put the G in poignancy. <laughs> for this fierce poignancy. I stand here as if lost, as if invisible on this broken cliff invisible sky above and for a second i float free of personality and die into my senses into the unglossed unglossable sweet and transporting yet attaching smell the very agent that releases me holding me here as well and that you know simultaneity of experience of both dying, being so transported by something that we're dead and also being so alive and attached to the sensory experience or so deeply immersed in the sensory experience is so wonderful and so roomy. And I'm gonna go to Rumi now because Rumi's always talking about death of the ego so that we can have these kinds of experiences like what Jane Hirschfield calls the vanishing. The vanishing, she says, my favorite part, of existence is at the end of the poem when I feel like I've vanished or when I'm writing and I feel like I've vanished. So um, since it's Friday night and I have like my seven minute thing that I just did a bunch of, um, I'm gonna do a little roomy. I have one line in the book. It's from a poem <clears throat> that I translated um, and the Persian uh, sounds like this. <laughs> Master 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 
آسمانا چند گردی گردش اون سور ببین آب مست و باد مست و خاک مست نار مست حال صورت این چونین و حال منی خود مپرس روح مست و عقل مست و وح مست اسرار مست اسرار مست 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 you heard me say over and over again in my slightly New Jersey Persian accent because I was born here mast means drunk drunk on love drunk on the wine of love so he says gardener listen thunder beats a drum clouds pour the wine the garden is drunk the meadow is drunk the buds and thorns are drunk whirling sky watch how the elements whirl water is drunk air is drunk earth is drunk fire is drunk don't even ask about the unseen spirit is drunk intellect is drunk imagination is drunk and the mysteries of eternity they're the drunkest of all liberate yourself from the tyranny of self be humble as soil and you will see every particle of soil is drunk on love by the creator's design in winter the garden is still drunk the roots of trees secretly sip wine <laughs> and and you know this celebration of garden and celebration of here i have this little device i'm going to share it with you here look at this <laughs> this is Rumi. how many eons must pass before the treasures i find here appear again why ignore them now how many eons must pass before the treasures i find here appear again why ignore them now i started a little high but here the treasures i find here he says spring is here spring is here dance is here the whirling dance is here the eternal bond and glorious breeze are here poppies, basil, and the tulip stunning eyes are here. Soft white stars of jasmine, sweet dizzying musk of jasmine. Where is your garden? I'll serve at the gate. A flower steps out of his tight bud, gives its nectar, gives its gold. How do we do the same? Dear nightingale, I bow to your bright songs, never the same twice. Master of improvisation perched in a tree. Flowers delight you, you delight us. How do we pass on the favor? Thank you. Um, our next reader is Mark Doty. Also, I'm so um, it's an amazing thing to be, you know, uh, walking in this parade of poetry and of poets. It's just such rich work, and every single piece stamped by a distinct personality. It's the thing that poetry can do for us is allow us to meet so many, encounter so many. Um, to work in a garden, you know, is, is very much an activity in the present, but. While you are there, you are also in a sort of a state of layered time because every garden refers back to the past, to the gardens that shaped our sense of what a garden is and to the people who made them. And we're always thinking about what comes next. We're always repairing what went wrong or didn't work or adding the new. So you're engaged in what is gone, what's happening now, what you hope is coming. So uh, one way that you think about being engaged in the future is of course, looking at seed catalogs and plant catalogs in the off season. And in a uh, few years back in a, a catalog of perennial flowers, I was looking at iris and there was a bearded iris called anvil of darkness. And I thought, can you imagine actually deciding to grow the anvil of darkness you know, in, in your garden? And the more I thought about that, the more I realized the anvil of darkness is already there down in the soil, the depth, the solid place, the impenetrable. So that gets into this poem, which is called Deep Lane. 
When I'm down in my when I'm down on my knees, pulling up wild mustard by the roots before it sets seed, hauling the old ferns further into the shade, I'm talking to the anvil of darkness. Break table, slab, no blow could dent, wrung with the making, and out of that chop and rot comes the fresh syrup of the lupins. When the shovel slips into white root flesh, into the meat coursing with cool water, when I'm grubbing on my knees, what is the hammer? Dusty skin of the tuber, naked worms who write on the soil every letter, my companion blind, all day we go digging, harrowing, rooting deep. Spade plunge and trowel, sweet turned down gas flame, slow charring carbon, out of which sprouts the wild unsayable. Beauty's the least of it. You get ready, like Deborah, who used to garden in the dark, hauling out candles and a tall glass of what she said was tea, and digging and reading and studying in the dirt. She'd bring a dictionary. If study is prayer, she said, I'm praying. If you've already gone down to the anvil, if you've rested your face on that adamant, maybe you're already changed. I wanted to read my poem first because I'm now going to read poems by two great American poets. The first also by Tom Gunn, who we heard from a moment ago. And this one is called Considering the Snail. The snail pushes through a green night where the grass is heavy with water and, meet, and meets over the bright path he makes where rain has darkened the earth's dark. He moves in a wood of desire, pale antlers barely stirring as he hunts. I cannot tell what power is at work, drenched then with purpose, knowing nothing. What is a snail's fury? All I think of is that later, if later I parted the blades above the tunnel and saw the thin trail of broken white across litter, I would never have imagined the slow passion to that deliberate progress. And this poem is by a poet who was an extraordinary gardener and a friend of mine, uh, the late Stanley Kunitz, who died just short of his 101st birthday in Provincetown, Massachusetts. There he had for many, many years, 40 years, he had been hauling seaweed up a dune to a house he had on the west end of town and turning that sand into soil, which produced one of the most beautiful gardens I've ever seen. And of course, like any garden when the gardener is gone, it's ephemeral. It changes completely. The, the person who animated it is no longer there to do so. This is, I believe, Stanley's last poem called Touch Me. Summer is late, my heart. Words plucked out of the air some 40 years ago when I was wild with love and torn almost in two, scattered like leaves, the night of whistling wind, this night of whistling wind and rain. It is my heart that's late. It is my song that's flown. Outdoors, all afternoon, under a gunmetal sky, staking my garden down, I kneel to the crickets, trilling underfoot, as if about to burst from their crusty shells. And like a child again, marvel to hear so clear and brave a music pour from such a small machine. What makes the engine go? Desire, desire, desire. The longing for the dance stirs in the buried life. One season only, and it's done. So let the battered old willow thrash against the window pane and the house timbers creak. Darling, do you remember the man you married? Touch me. Remind me who I am. Thank you. Thank you. Sophie Cabot Black. Okay, thank you so much to all who have been a part of this project. It's been a delight to be a part of it. And uh, the book itself, which I've bought many copies and actually gave for Christmas, has been a big hit with those who love poetry and those who love gardening and those who really don't know a lot about either. So I highly suggest bringing it into your life as best you can. And also many, many thanks, most of all to Tess Taylor for pulling this together for her vision and her her work, all of it. And uh, I mean, we really, we are all coming together because of, I love what you had uh, put in the beginning of the book, a wonderful quote from Gwendolyn Brooks, that we are each other's harvest. 
We are each other's business and we are each other's magnitude and bond. And I think you can really hear that in these poems tonight. And as you read or, or don't read cover to cover, but pick through this wonderful anthology. I'm first gonna read the poem that I brought to the table. It's called The Garden. And it was written about a garden that I have known for 60 years out here where I am. The Garden. Even by the gate, we could not see the rose. Only gone stalks, the paving stones upturned, the reach of wild cherry, beech, and ash over the rusted post, as if to claim whatever rises as their own. Who moves first decides. Clear the root, the withered stem, the slash to burn next season. Stakes of names and faded packets piled, cast out by the entrance as the plow waits for us to make sense of each original harrow, tamp, or hardened mound. This year will be better. The mole and crow, each to their corner, as the horse turns to watch you deep in the dirt, to start with the one good and simple seed. And then the next two poems I'm gonna read are kind of the both wilder ones in this anthology. Uh, this one is by C.D. Wright, Song of the Gourd, and it's on page 72. And I feel like they're both sides of a, of a coin. That's why um, they came into my life the way they did. Song of the Gourd. In gardening, I continued to sit on my side of the car to drive whenever possible at the usual level of distraction. In gardening, I shat nails, glass, contaminated dirt, and threw up on the new shoots. In gardening, I learned to praise things I had dreaded. I pushed the hair out of my face. I felt less responsible for one man's death, one woman's long-term isolation. My bones softened. In gardening, I lost nickels and ring settings. I uncovered buttons and marbles. I lay half the worm aside and sought the rest. I sought myself in the bucket and wondered why I came into being in the first place. In gardening, I turned away from the television and went around smelling of awful and inedible parts of the chicken. In gardening, I said, Excelsior, in gardening, I required no company. I had to forgive my own failure to perceive how things were. I went out bare-legged at dusk and dug and dug and dug. I hit rock, my ovaries softened. In gardening, I was protean, and as in no other realm before or since, I longed to torch my old belongings and belch a little flame of satisfaction. In gardening, I longed to stroll farther into soundlessness. I could almost forget what happened many swift years ago in Arkansas. I felt like a god from down under. Thonian, in gardening, I thought this is it, body and soul. I am home at last. Excelsior, praise the grass. In gardening, I fled the fold that supported the war. Only in gardening could I stop shrieking, stop, stop the slaughter. Only in gardening could I press my ear to the ground to hear my soul let out an unyielding noise. My lines softened. I turned the water onto the joy-filled boy child. Only in gardening did I feel fit to partake, to go on trembling in the last light. I confess the abject urge to weed your beds while the bittersweet overwhelmed my daylilies. I summoned the courage to grin. I climbed the hill with my bucket and slept like a dipper in the cool of your body, besotted with growth, shot through by green. And a companion to this poem, which I'm sure 
many of you know, probably even by heart, is on page 119, 119, Walt Whitman from Song of Myself. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. The last scud of day holds back for me. It flings my likeness after the rest and true as any on the shadowed wilds, it coaxes me to the vapor and the dusk. I depart as air. I shake my white locks at the runaway sun. I effuse my flesh in eddies and drift it in lacy jags. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me, at first keep encouraged, missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. Thank you for this gathering, Tess and all. Dolly, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Hala. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> thank you, Danusha. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ashley. If I missed anyone reading backwards up the list, forgive me. Thank you. Um, it's really wonderful to hear these poems. And um, it's been really amazing to be companioned by them for this time. Um, I'm just going to close with two short ones. And we'll have a moment to ask questions or reflect together. Um, and then I'll read a closing poem. So we're, we're just in the last moments of this winter reading that makes us think about being connected to the cycles of life. So um, there is a, a season that has come to be in California known as fire season. We used to just call it October, but now the wind blows very hot and we all know what the hot wind means. Um, it's also a season when a fruit called green tomatoes <laughs> when tomatoes that don't ripen wait for us to pick them. And I put these both in a poem. Um, so I'll read my, my offering to the anthology, Green Tomatoes in Fire Season. There is smoke in the air when I go pick them. I go despite panic also because inside I'll make chutney. For an hour or so, I unlatch them. It is late fall. They will not ripen, firm, pale, green skins, fine-coated in ash. Our fire season goes all autumn now, though today's, though today's fire is not yet near to us. But the green tomatoes, I love their pale lobes. Tonight, God willing, we will fry some with cornmeal and fish. Inside, the air purifier whirs. I will boil them with molasses and raisin, jar them for friends and for the winter. Disaster, we say, meaning bad star. These are good green stars. This is also their season. Mask on, I bend and bend to the vine. I bend and salvage what I can. Um, I could tell that I was really, really into this project when I wanted to stick in extra poems in funny places. And my editor, I had to call and be like, is there anywhere to stick just one more poem? And my editor was so kind. And she like had a little extra poem under the acknowledgement section. And I want to close with this poem. It's actually a little bit of a snippet of Virgil's Georgics, which is one of our old for farming poems passed down to us, you know, through time, that tells us a little bit about um, farming in, um, 
in its relationship to plenty and also in its relationship to famine and war. And it reminds us that one side of the coin is the pleasure and abundance that we can make. And always in these old farming poems, soldiers are coming back from war and or trying to make fields that have been um, damaged by war able to be farmed again. And so I'm just going to read a tiny little bit of that. I know that all of us are thinking about those dynamics in the world right now, about these questions of what do we call um, migration that is really hunger? What do we call war that is really hunger? What farms will not be able to be tilled this year? Um, where could there be a farm instead of a bomb? Virgil, olives. Olives, by contrast, need no care. Don't call for machete or stubborn hoe. Once they've clung to the fields and bowed to the breezes, the earth which the plowshare exposed of herself offers up moist, heavy fruit. Oh, suckle the olive, fat, pleasing to peace. I want to end there or just turn it over to you, the lovely group of nearly over a hundred people who's been with us for this slightly over an hour on a Friday night. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Somebody sent me a, a question in the chat right away, which I just wanted to address, which is how could my gar garden in Brooklyn have so many more pollinators than the rest of the streets of Brooklyn? And I don't know. An entomologist came and studied the pollinator populations, by which I think they were meaning species of, of bee, bumblebee, but also like other kinds of small inse insect pollinators. I'm not talking necessarily about bird pollinators. And was like, all these species are present in this patch that is your garden, and they are not present on the other block blocks. And to me, this was this formative understanding that, you know, like Field of Dreams, if we build it, they will come. And that these places that we build for repair in our cities, in our civic spaces, in our in our daily lives, they matter. The time you take to read a poem matters. The, the space that is a garden in which many more things can live than live in the ordinary city block matters. And, um, and just thinking about remembering also that these things that are destroyed are not so far destroyed that they can't be repaired. And gardeners, I think, know that. Um, and I think artists know that too. I think artists, this is something that we cling to. Um, so, okay, now there's more questions. Um, I'm gonna turn this one out, out to our wide wider group here. Question. I know that some of you are also teachers in addition to being poets. What do you still learn about poetry by teaching? Ellen, Mark, and thank you for this reading. And Brett Warren just ordered three copies. Thank you, Brett. <laughs> Mark and Ellen, will you answer? Oh, you have to unmute yourself though. Teaching keeps you awake to everything that a poem can do. You, you present it all the time with this text you've never seen before. And look at these words, these phrases, these patterns and say, what is this? And it, they start to emerge as a something, as something that is unfamiliar, even though you've read 10,000 poems or 20,000 poems. Something happens when a self shapes words that reflect that self. And uh, our job as teachers is in part just to say, what is happening? What do we see here? to mirror it back. Well, Help, one, please. <laughs> one of the other things um, that, that I notice all the time is when I go to teach a poem that I admire, mm -hmm. uh, I start to delve into it even more deeply perhaps than if I, even though I might've read that poem 50 or hundred times before, I'm trying to really look at it so that I can point out how the elements of the craft are working in that poem. And sometimes I see things that I can't believe I haven't seen before. And um, I tell my students, you know, you can, you can do this for yourself. You don't need me to talk about this poem for you. Uh, just pretend that you're teaching it and that, you know, in an hour, you're gonna have to talk to people about it and spend that hour 
trying to uh, determine what's going on in that poem and how the poet did it. And you could do you can do exactly for yourself what I'm doing for you. But there, there's also something so beautiful about the community of a classroom and the idea that we all in the community value this written word that we're that we're that we're tech, you know, making exploring the textures and the sounds together. That each class that I ever teach builds its own vocabulary. Um, one class decided to call you know, strong edits on a poem, radical haircuts, um, which is just language. And then, you know, it emerged and bubbled up in that class. And so it's this beautiful occasion for building a kind of community language and framework for holding poetry as well um, and for delighting in it. It's like language for delight, you know, so that I, and I've never stopped thinking about that radical. Does this poem need a radical haircut? <laughs> Bryn, do you want to say anything? I'm just, I know there's so many, Danusha, do you want to say anything about teaching or? I just, I mean, it's sort of like a garden in there, yeah? <laughs> like kind of cultivating that space together and tending, tending to it um, and learning from it and the wildness of it. And I'll just say teaching has also redefined kind of what poetry is. My students, my, a lot of my students come to poetry through Instagram and TikTok and, and, and these wild, these other forms and these other ways of knowing and being and being alive. And so it just expanded what a poem is for me. Yeah. I love that. And I, I would just add a little, can, am I, I'm unmuted well, right? I'm good. Yeah, you are. You're there. Uh, <laughs> just for a minute. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this idea that love is attention. Mm. Love is attention. And I find that in teaching, I'm moved to pay attention differently, to pay a keen attention um, to the line, to the image, what's happening. And so I feel for me, it's grown my love of poetry because it helps to maintain my a certain quality of attentiveness and when i read for pleasure i'm paying attention but i'm paying attention differently and when i'm looking at a student's work i'm really kind of cocking my ear a little differently you know what's happening why did that work so well and oh why you know why is the next line not quite doing that what's happening so I think that that's what draws me toward it is, um, and what I gain as well, is a sense of a growing love for poetry because of that type of attention. A wordy way of saying that, but that's what I feel. Um, I Somebody commended to us the beautiful translation by David Ferry of the Georgics. I just wanted to amplify that as well. The Georgics is this very interesting Roman farm poem um, about hunger and plenty and trying to live on earth. Um, and it was interesting because Robert Hass thought of that as the beginning of a thing called documentary poetry, poetry of journalism, poetry about the world, the how-to poetry. And sometimes we think of like, poems like Wordsworth's where we're remembering the daffodil or something, but there's also kind of a, a poetry that tells us how to do things in the world. And one of the things that we have to do is figure out how to live on earth. And um, the Georgics is really attempting to, to deal with that and to deal with how to write a poem of home, the Georgic, as opposed to the epic that's going out to make war. And I think this question of like, how do we live in our lives at home in the presence of a world torn apart by war? How do we make ethical choices? These are Georgic questions in a way. So I just wanted to say, if you know, if this is a topic that interests you, I wanted to amplify that comment that was in the chat. Um, I feel that people are mostly just happy that there's a lot of delight in the chat more than questions. Um, but I, I love that there is this delight and I love that there is this nourishment. Um, if there is another question, maybe we'll put it in the chat. And if not, I have one more poem to send us out into our Friday. Um, 
but mostly as somebody just amplified the idea that love is attention, love is deep attention and poetry and gardening share that fact that as we do both, those are ways of tending and attending and that giving our attention to the non-human world and to the community that we can build with each other and the abundance that we can build. Um, this week, I saw two separate flyers of different organizations around town where people will come and harvest your fruit that you didn't get to on your tree and take it to a, um, a food shelter. And that's here in Berkeley. Um, but I was thinking about how sometimes when we do garden, we have so much more. We have this reverse economy where we're urgent to have people share with us as opposed to the other kind of economy that we live in a lot of times. And similarly, I think that feeling of the, of the poem as a kind of a, a gift in the sense that Lewis Hyde writes about in his book, The Gift, where it needs to keep moving and be passed on in order to live in the world. And this has been such an amazing chance to be with all of you. Um, okay, I'm, I'm just going to say... Oh, One. Tess, be, before you close oh. uh, close out the evening with a poem, which thank you so much for doing that, um, I just want to say thank you so much for this anthology and thank you to all the poets for tonight's incredible readings and as well as the thoughtful conversation. And to our audience, thank you for being here. If you enjoyed this reading, please buy this book for the gardener in your life or for yourself. Uh, the link is in the chat. And you can use code HVWC at checkout for 20% off through February 2nd at the Hatchet Book Group website. Again, the link will be in the chat. Um, thank you so much. And thank you again. And back to Tess, who's going to read one last poem for us tonight. Thank you. Yeah, I will. And I also just wanted to say that I'm so grateful. Story did like make this 20% discount, which they, they did because they you know, we're excited about Hudson Valley Writer Center and you, this community, which is such a vibrant one. I can't wait to be there in person someday. Um, yeah. So just thank you, Hudson Valley Writers Workshop, for this space to gather all these people. Um, at the very first reading of this anthology, the poet Forrest Gander made a joke that I've been making, stealing from him and making ever since, which is to say, I wrote this poem in the year 1821. Sorry, I wrote this poem in the year 1818 under the pseudonym John Keats. So this poem by John Keats will close out the night on the grasshopper and cricket. The poetry of earth is never dead when all the birds are faint with the hot sun and hide in cooling trees, a voice will run from hedge to hedge about the new mown mead. That is the grasshoppers. He takes the lead in summer luxury. He has never done with his delights, for when tired out with fun, he rests at ease beneath some pleasant weed. The poetry of earth is ceasing never on a lone winter evening when the frost has wrought a silence from the stove there shrills the cricket's song in warmth increasing ever, and seems to one in drowsiness half lost, the grasshoppers beneath some grassy hills. Happy winter, you all. Thank you for being here tonight.